Welcome to Haxby Shed and part one of the Shaper Miller project. Now I don't have a milling machine, I decided not to buy one because I can manage most of the time with my Elliott 10M Shaper and the milling attachment on my lathe. But without doubt on some occasions it would be better to have a milling head. So I looked at my Shaper and I thought about it and I realised, well, it's got a table. The table goes up and down. This here goes up and down, it goes across this way and the ram can be made, adjusted to come in and out here. So I've actually got all three planes of movement across this table. If I could mount a motor on here, put a collet chuck on it, put an end mill in it, I've basically got a milling head. Now I'm not working to fantastic precision here, you know, I'm not making aircraft wings. Most of the time that would be good enough. I can adjust this table to within about a thou in any direction. Well, up and down or side to side anyway. Um, and with a bit of thought, I could get similar adjustment on this ram. The guy that was just talking there behind me is at the beginning and I'm at the end. And I'm just dropping this note in to say that it actually does work. All of you people that have got your hands over the keyboard right now to tell me it can't possibly work, don't embarrass yourself because within the limits of what I need, it does. But it's been a long journey. And I'm not going to show you all the twists and turns because honestly, it would be too boring. You would be asleep and you'd probably never come back again. So I've picked out the bits that really matter. I've had to improve the design many, many times. Now remember, this is only for jobs where I cannot use the shaper. So it's just to go into pockets and blind ends and things like that. I've tried it on steel and brass. Within the limits of what I need, it actually works pretty well. I'll show you a couple of samples and then I'll go back to the guy behind me um, to kick us off for the series. This is just to give you some reassurance that it does actually work. This was on brass obviously and here's on steel. So, I decided first of all to look for a motor. I usually would buy something secondhand and make it fit, but I decided this time to shell out and, and pay for one. I paid about £100 for a motor. It comes with a 3D model. I've done a bit of work on Fusion 360 um, and I'll show you that. We'll go to the computer and I'll show you that. Um, I need to buy some metal for a bracket. I need to buy the collet chuck um, and a few other things. But basically, one way or another, I'm going to get this working. I don't know yet how I'm going to adjust the ram in or out in this dimension. The plan is it would be fixed. Clearly the ram can't go back and forwards. Um, that would be just working like a shaper, wouldn't it? It's going to be an interesting experiment. I hope to get a lot of capability for about £150. If I was going to buy a miller, well, that's somewhere between a thousand and two thousand pounds, even for a smaller one. And that may or may not come with tooling. And then there's a space for it and so on. So I hope you enjoy the series. Let's get on with it. When I started to think about the size of motor that I needed, I had to think about the power, but I also had to think about the physical size. So I started with CAD cardboard aided design and this is a model of a 375 watt motor and this one is a model of a 550 watt motor and the two spindle sizes that you can see there all right it's a bit of a joke but they are actually representative so for this 375 watt motor that was an 11 millimeter spindle and for this motor 550 watts it was a 14 millimeter spindle so I decided actually 14 was the smallest diameter that I could work with really. So although this is a bit of comedy, it actually helped me quite a lot in deciding what physical size of motor that I needed to go for, irrespective of, of the power that I need. So here we're looking at the Fusion 360 workspace and I've downloaded the model for the motor. And we can turn various bits on and off if we want to like this and then we can swivel it around in any direction and so on. 
So that's my starting point. So the next thing I need to do is to make a model for my shaper. Then I can put this on, which is to scale. I can put this on and see what sort of, um, how it will look and what the clearances are. And uh, you get the idea. Not strictly essential, to be honest. Normally I would have done my diagrams in Visio, in 2D. But I'd been on the ARW chat with Harold and we'd spent an hour talking about 3D modeling and it looked pretty interesting to me. So I thought that I'd have a go. Now I'm not going to attempt to show you how to use Fusion 360. Uh, my friend DJ from Foxburg's Faber Coblin is going to be running a mini series on that, but I'll show you how I used it. So here's my shaper model. It took me quite a bit of work to get this because this was the first time I'd ever used Fusion 360. I was really pleased with the table and I've made the other components to go on it. So let's hope I click the right things in the right order. There's the motor. That's the same model that I've just imported. Well, of course, the motor needs a bracket. So there's the bracket and we need a chuck. So there's the chuck. And I won't go into the detail, but you can measure all these distances. So if we swivel that around, I think it looks quite nice. Just a bit of Fusion 360. Right, now to get this motor cabled up and tested. Well, my motor is in pieces. And why is that? because as it spins I can hear something grunging inside and then when I look at it I find lots of aluminium bits. Not good. Can you see all those bits? Well I've blown all the swarf out of it and put it back together. It's not very quiet. Don't worry about this braid here, I need to buy some sleeving for that don't have the right size at the moment. So having blown the motor out with the airline, I put it back together again, ran it. I still wasn't altogether happy with it. Now I could have sent it back, but looking on eBay, all the motors are the same anyway. They might have different names on them. So there wasn't any point doing that because I'd probably just get another one just the same. So I've taken the armature out. I've set it up on the lathe. I'm checking to see if it seems to be reasonably balanced. I'm also checking the bearings in case any of that swarf got into the bearings. So let's have a look at it on the lathe now. But just before we look at the lathe, can you see that? Just there. Excuse the torch, but look at this. See? And I know what's happened now. As they've pressed these windings into this body, it's a press fit and it's caused shavings. So I'll have to scrape all those off. Otherwise they'll only break off later. I've seen this before with these cheap motors. Another use for my tailstock four jaw. It's running out by about five one hundredths of a millimetre. So about two and a half thou, something like that. Okay, so with the bearings broadly in line, we can spin it. And it spins pretty freely, so I don't think anything's got into those bearings. They're NSK 6202s, ZZ, so they've got the shielding on both sides. This is mostly just for fun. Although this doesn't seem to be heavier in one spot, I thought I'd just have a look and see if it was concentric. And although this is jumping about, I can tell you that it is pretty much spot on. But when I move this dial gauge to here, it's a different story. Watch this. <laughs> it's about a millimetre 
off concentric. Now it's only aluminium, obviously, but it's not going to help the balance really. And uh, I'm just deciding whether or not to do anything about that. This end is not too bad. Only swings off by about 0.2 of a mil. Mm, but even so, look at this. We know this is running concentrically, so that's fine. But just look at this here. 0.2 of a millimetre about. Maybe 0.1 actually. Well that's not going to help the balance, is it? Anyway, I'm going to machine these faces here and get those running concentrically. I'm hoping to do it without pressing the bearings off. I did have to take the bearings off. I've machined this outer. I've machined this inner ring here, if you can see it there. And honestly, these were at least a millimetre out of true. I'm going to finish by just machining a bit off here, about 0.2 millimetres. This is fine and concentric with this, and the same for the bearing at the other end. It's just. Am I wasting my time? I probably am, but I'm doing it. That's all I can say. Let's get it back together and see if it makes any difference whatsoever. Right, here goes. Well, Believe me or not, but that motor is a lot quieter and there's a lot less vibration. It feels pretty smooth now. The key is out at the moment. Yep, I'm a lot happier with that now. I just need to put a remanufactured label on it and we can move on. It's time to mark out for this motor bracket and with a bit of trial and error I've worked out what this radius is here with the help of my compasses which my dad left me made by P. Lowentrout, New, New Jersey. Now for the motor end. So there'll be a hole in there and then a curved end. They're nice rigid compasses these. Measure off for the securing holes. Center one and a quarter and four and a quarter. There we go. Should be three between them, which there is. So this is the bottom of the upright bracket. The bottom securing screw will go about there. This is going to be the motor bracket that sticks out here. And it's got to fix on above the screw and a bit because I've got to allow for a fillet weld. So probably it'll cross about there, I would think.
Now I've got to allow for the thickness of the plate, which is eight millimetres. So that's, that's eight millimetres further up. And now this bracket, this vertical bracket, has to extend at least 125 millimetres from that line. Okay, so that can be cut there. I'll go and take a proper measurement off the motor, but it's something like this. Mm, 25. 25 from this face will clear this knob. This is the cowl off the motor, it's 140 across, and that'll be about there. Maybe a bit lower, I'm not sure, maybe a bit lower. So the end of the horizontal bracket will be half of 140, so that's 70, from that centre point of this circle, there let's say, plus 25 to clear that knob. So the end of this bracket is going to be about there. So there's the end. Hold on, schoolboy error alert. 70 plus 25 minus 8 because this vertical bracket's 8 thick. Nearly did it, didn't I? There we go. How we're going to machine this hole out? I don't like hole saws. We'll put it on the lathe, put that in the fore jaw. I think it'll fit. Let's have a look. I think we'll only have to turn one round actually. And bring these out a bit. Whoops. Actually, that'll do. So I'll get this cut now. I really like this chuck, it's a brute. Time to change this blade. I've had it in there long enough and it's taking forever to cut. I've put a couple of spacers into this blade here. There's one there and there's one there and it just gets it vertically aligned because it was inclined to cut a bit off like that. But with these two quite small spacers, I don't know if you can see that, but they're only ever so thin, but it makes all the difference. Okay. Tighten this end up. And then tighten this up, this Allen screw. And it cuts on the forward stroke. I see many people ask that question. It cuts on the forward stroke. I haven't done much machining in a while, so it's quite nice to be doing this. I've used a dead centre to line this in the centre, on that pop I made in the centre of the circle. Now this plate is supported behind on this jaw, but not on the other three jaws. So I just use this tool as a spacer when I set it up. I've taken this out, so this is unsupported behind, but the jaws on this chuck are so powerful, my gamble is that it will never push this in. One and one thirty-two on about two hundred and fifteen RPM. Seven fifty RPM, one mil cut. Let's see what this does. It 
it's not chipping so well. Now what do they say? Less speed, more feed. Let's try that. Well that worked. I put the feed up by 50% and I reduced the speed to 600. The hole's getting a bit bigger so I've reduced the speed to 380. Still one millimetre cuts. Finish cut. I must set up a spray coolant system one of these days. I'll just sham for this while I've got the opportunity. Test fit. Woohoo! Perfect. <laughs>